Uh, and yes, now we'll take a little bit of a break because we have a very special guest who's joining us. Um, Senator Peter Welch from Vermont is, uh, is with us. And Senator, you're not that far removed from the House of Representatives. So if this were a couple years ago, you'd have the day off. Right. Sorry that you're in session today, but we really, really appreciate your willingness to make your, the long way over here uh, to, the, to the House side. Um, you have a couple very, very important committee assignments. You're on the Committee on Agriculture, Chair of the Rural Development and Energy Subcommittee. Uh, you're also part of the, or a member of the Commerce, Science, and Transportation uh, Committee. Um, we've talked about energy efficiency earlier in the day, which is, uh, I think, about as close to your heart as you can get uh, and when it comes to clean energy policy. So we really appreciate your leadership there. I'll invite you up. If you'd like to say a few words to our audience, we also have a robust online audience. Uh, and I understand you'd also be willing to take a question or two. I don't want to get in the way. Oh, no, you're fine. We'll pick people up who, with Charles. People who know what they're doing. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, sir. Oh, well, just a couple things. First of all, I'm really excited to be here, and I served on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, for years uh, in, in the House. And you're right, energy efficiency uh, was a focus of my attention, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that that was the one place uh, where there was some potential to get a bipartisan support. My friend David McKinley from West Virginia, uh, coal mining West Virginia, was a tremendous ally on that. Uh, trying to do things directly, like they ultimately did with the Inflation Reduction Act, that was a little bit of a challenge. And I'll give a little background, backdrop of where we came from and where we're at and why what you're doing, ESI and each of you, uh, Connor, was interesting just listening to all the possibilities there is so important. When I came to Congress, which is 07, uh, there was a lot of climate change denial, right? Uh, I found that I had arrived from Vermont, uh, which is totally uh, on a bipartisan basis, into doing everything we can uh, for the environment uh, and where we believed in climate change. Uh, I arrived here and I uh, started associate, associating with some of the finest minds of the 17th century. And <laughs> They denied climate change. What you talking about was kind of the attitude. And that was a real uh, boulder to push up the hill for quite a while. And when I first got here, they really didn't believe in it, the folks who were against it. They really didn't. And uh, as time went on, and as the evidence mounted, it became undeniable. I realized what the holdback, even more than just denial, was fear. <coughs> It was fear about the dislocation that would occur in many communities uh, if we had to make the changes that are required to move us to a clean, uh, renewable energy economy. Um, and you know that was real, too, to me, because I thought those of us who were pushing hard uh, for significant changes uh, in carbon emission reductions were a little slow to acknowledge that there were some real world impacts. And uh, it's a reason why with David McKinley, who, as I mentioned, was a tremendous partner, I, he lives in coal country. And I took a trip with him and spent the weekend at his home and went down into a coal mine. And, uh, uh, and, and it was really compelling, because the folks there that are working in those coal mines, I mean, they didn't create climate change, right? Uh, they're hardworking folks who care about the same thing you and I care about, and that's working hard, doing a good job, and being a member of the community and raising your family. And after we finished being in that coal mine, that was scary, by the way. Those guys worked harder than anybody but dairy farmers. Uh, and then they wanted to have a little fun with their member of Congress. So we're down 1,000 feet, and we're riding in uh, five miles to where the uh, pit, where, the, where they were actually doing the mining, you get on those little railroad cars. Uh, they turn the lights off, all right? <laughs> it's dark <laughs> when you're 1,000 feet down. But we came out and had sat around and had a meal and was talking to the coal miners and just really, really wonderful people. And in that community, that on Friday nights, everyone would go to the local high school games. You know, a wonderful community event. Well, like 12 years before I was there, they used to have eight high schools. Now they were down to three. Mm. So there's real uh, pain there. And we can't, if we're going to make progress, we have to acknowledge that reality. Now, fast forward, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and it was bipartisan. And it's extraordinary because it's the first time where, with public policy, we've acknowledged the existence of the problem, 
and we've supported solutions with significant public policy initiatives, including tax incentives, uh, that give a boost to starting to address uh, the issues that have to be faced in order to uh, bring down the carbon emissions, <coughs> hopefully to zero. That was hard, okay, to get that passed and painful. And it's a start. But the really hard work is what you're doing. That's why it's so important that you're here, because the only way ultimately we're going to get over the fear that people have of dislocation, disruption in their communities, disruption in their way of life, is by making options for clean energy affordable and at scale. And it's really, that's the harder work. You know, as hard as it was for us uh, to legislatively pass this law, it's really much harder now to make these options affordable, available, and at scale so that people have the ability to affordably take advantage of clean energy options. And that's what I'm saying about the coal miners. You know, it's, it is disruption, but everybody who's on a family budget who clearly would prefer their kids to be able uh, to breathe clean air, uh, who clearly uh, are horrified about the extraordinary weather changes that we're having. In Vermont, by the way, this county, Washington County, which is where Montpelier, our capital is, it's in the top 10 areas with FEMA disaster declarations. That's Vermont. And, you know, just years ago, people thought that was going to be a refuge. And we get these micro storms that are wiping out farms, that are wiping out homes. So what I find so exciting about what you're doing, and just it was interesting just listening to you talk about hydrogen, and I know each of you has something similar uh, that you're talking about doing at scale, is once we get to that tipping point where instead of fearing the problem, we embrace the challenging, the challenge of solving the problem, that's actually where you start creating wealth. That's where you start getting a bit of a bounce in your step, that you're doing something that needs to be done, and by the doing of something that needs to be done, you're actually creating jobs, you're creating wealth, and you're creating, oh, by the way, a cleaner uh, and more sustainable environment. So that's what I see is the place we're at. We went from me arriving in 07, where there was real hard bedrock climate denial, to then resistance and fear, to the passage of legislation, and now the implementation that has to include research, engineering, and practical ways to make these options that have to be across the whole economy and across the way we live, uh, they all have to be addressed. So thank you so much uh, for your work, for your commitment to research, for your commitment to the very hard work of getting things done on a practical level that can be brought up to scale. So it's wonderful to be your partner in this long-term effort uh, to get to a zero emission economy and a stronger economy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'm, I'm, glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned your work with Representative McKinley, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the energy efficiency bills that eventually became part of you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, okay. yeah. you've, you've kept doing that, and I just wanted to plug some work that you've been doing with Senator Murkowski around the Rural Energy right. Savings Act. Is there any Act. senator in the whole United States Senator better than Lisa Murkowski? I challenge you to tell me. She's fantastic. Okay. That's a great, it's a great bill. It's one that we've worked with your office on, the Rural Energy Savings Act. It would improve the Rural Energy Savings Program. It's something we talked a little bit about on our Rural and Tribal Communities panel a little bit. But I mention that because it's great, but also because it's another example of your willingness to work across the aisle. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned you might have time for a question or yeah, two. So sure. I'm going to look for hands. We have a microphone in the room. Um, I'm going to get us started. So Senator, I, um, we didn't have a chance to connect, but I'm from Graniteville, 05654, in the heart of Washington County. My, I grew up there, and the floods have just been awful. And we were up in Swanton for our family vacation a couple weeks ago. 
Um, how are things going up there? How are communities well, it's, you know, recovering? It's, how, how are they it's feeling? It's terrible. Okay, you know, when you, we had these floods. We had a huge flood in 2011, the worst since 1927. Then in 2023 in July, we had these huge floods. And then 2024, a year to the day later, people were wiped out in Barry. The floods came back. And when people would ask me here, and, and all the members are they're, they're empathetic to the weather events that happen in all of our districts. You know, it was hard to answer it in a way because on the one level, after the immediate trauma, yep, and if FEMA's there, uh, there's, a, there's, there's an immediate response where emotionally you're feeling supported by everybody in your community. But then two weeks in, life goes on for everybody else. But if it's your home, if it's your farm, uh, if it's your business, it got flooded out. I mean, it is hard. And then we had that in July of 2023 and in July of 2024 20, to the same date, a lot of those same communities, a lot of those same businesses and a couple of the same farms were hit again. And that is truly exhausting. It's really wearing people down, asking the question of, wait, if this is going to keep happening, and it's a reasonable expectation that it will keep happening, right? You know, you somehow think it won't, but then when it does and then it does again, then, you know, you, you know. So it's, 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 it, it wears you down a bit, uh, and it takes its toll. So uh, we're doing all we can, but it's tough. And the idea that we're going to dodge uh, the consequences the, uh, bit, rippling out throughout the economy of these weather events is obviously naive. And for Vermont, it's these microstorms. Like right now, St. Johnsbury got flooded because it was nine inches of rain in just one little location. Okay, so this is weird. I mean, the state paid more or less, I mean, I live in Norwich, about 60 miles from St. Johnsbury. We just got a little rain that we needed. But up there, it all concentrated, and we've got these valleys. All, all the water comes rushing down, the storms rise, and then cause the real damage. Uh, but if you're in Hawaii, it's the fires. If you're in California right now, it's the fires. If, if you're in Houston, it's this constant water that's coming up. So times are wasting, and we we know that we're all in this together. But it's gonna it's it's gonna continue this work that you all are doing. Yes, sir. We have a question in the front. Uh, Lindsay will bring over a mic. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for coming down. Um, I'm curious if you wake up in 2024 and. Legislatively, everything looks exactly how you want. What's next? What's the big next priority that you feel is uh, either untackled by IRA and Bill, et cetera, or is just something that needs to be expanded upon? Well, you know, where we are legislatively, I think there's two things. One, I really do think the implementation issues that have to be addressed by the private sector are absolutely critical, okay? Because we've got to make it affordable. But we also know that there's got to be some significant process changes. Like, we've got to have better transmission. I also think we've got to look at our permitting system. I'm a strong person that favors uh, protecting uh, environmental and health values and having a process by which you do that. But I want an answer sooner rather than later, OK? And I think those of us who believe that uh, something like transmission lines are really essential to get clean energy from where it can be produced. Uh, to where it's needed, have to do that. It's just like in housing. We've got to make it easier to build houses, right? We've got a housing shortage. We've got to build houses. So how do we do that? And that means taking a look at some of the procedures that um, a lot on my side have relied on, regulatory uh, 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 issues that have a legitimate purpose, but sometimes in application do some, do some harm. Well, thank you, Senator Welch. Thank that you. was very nice of you to stop by. We know it's a busy day over there in the Senate, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to your staff. Uh, Evelyn, if you're watching. Lucas, if you're watching. Um, thanks uh, 